just about noon. So we'll go ahead and get started. Um, got a few intro slides, and then we'll turn it over to the main event. Uh, welcome to the BSUC series. For those that aren't familiar, um, if you're coming from IBIPSA um, and aren't familiar with this series, or the Building Simulation Users Group, um, and we're University of Idaho uh, Integrated Design Lab. So there are a few IDLs throughout the Northwest, um, founded by the Northwest Energy Efficiency Lines. We work with uh, different uh, industry um, and utilities to provide education and outreach is really what we're, we're all about. So we're mostly student-led because we're a branch of the College of Art and Architecture. Um, so we're all either faculty or um, research scientists um, or students who are in the midst of finals right now. It's, it's April in academia, so this is a busy time. Um, but we do have an open research scientist spot that we'll be advertising for shortly. Um, so keep an eye out for that on our website. Uh, and if my slides will advance, there we go. Uh, like I said, we're really all about outreach and education. We're not trying to compete with private industry. We're, we're here to enhance it. Uh, for those that are dedicated to high efficiency, um, high performance buildings. So one of the programs that we offer, and this is through Idaho Power, is our energy resource library. So if you are in Idaho Power service territory um, and have a project, you want to figure out why your building isn't behaving the way that you think it ought to, or want to check the indoor air quality or things like that, duct pressures, We've got the tools for you, they're free. Uh, we'll show you how to use them. Uh, and it's a, it's a great resource. Even though in-person operations are still somewhat suspended due to COVID, we can do kind of non-contact um, check-in and check out of these tools. So um, let us know, um, it's a great resource. And Idaho Power is also responsible for um, today's presentation and you know furthering the education and outreach for those that are designing and simulating buildings and using you know a variety of different software and tools to you know minimize their their footprints minimize their reliance on the grid which is great we also offer technical design assistance at various levels so if you're interested in a new technology or want you know perhaps like a portion of an energy audit or, or really training uh, for you and your team to understand something more about an energy efficiency technology. Uh, that's what we're here for. And it sounds strange, but up to $4,000 worth of our time is free, right? Um, it is paid for by Idaho Power. There is, there's an approval process, but there's usually a pretty quick turnaround as long as it's focused on teaching you and enhancing energy efficiency. And then if it's a larger project, you know, something that's more than $4,000 worth of our time, that's when there's a slight cost share, but you know, the client will only pay 25% of that fee and Idaho Power covers the rest. And it can be a really good uh, way of, you know, having a little bit of skin in the game and yet, you know, encouraging your whole practice to learn new methods, new technologies, um, new software that will help you out in the long term. Separately, Idaho Power has their own commercial and industrial energy efficiency program. Uh, it's available for both new construction and retrofit options, um, both prescriptive as well as custom projects. Uh, so feel free to you know, reach out to them. I see Sheree Wilhite and Chris Paulo are on the call today. Um, so you know, message them in the chat if you've got a project and um, check out their website um, as well. So that's that's enough um, talking about us right now. So uh, I'll go ahead and stop sharing so Dr. Wetter can set up his screen. And while he's doing that, um, I, I will say that it's my pleasure to, to introduce him. So today's speaker, Dr. Michael Wetter, um, is likely well known to the building simulation community. He's done so much to advance the field of energy efficiency in buildings by developing various simulation tools, including leading spawn of Energy Plus, uh, open building control, contributing to many other platforms, including the Medelica Building Library and the GenOpt Optimization Program. And all of these tools have really helped engineers and architects design structures that perform well 
and use less energy than conventional buildings might. Um, Dr. Wetter received his bachelor's in building technologies at Lucerne University and his PhD from UC Berkeley. Now he's working as computational staff science at Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. And I don't know if you recall Dr. Wetter, but many years ago, uh, I guess not that many years ago, but for me, it felt like an age ago. Uh, you helped answer some of my fumbling questions on simulating radiant systems and the building controls virtual test bed when I was working on my own PhD here. And I'll always be grateful for your time and response on that. Um, so I'm grateful to have you here again to present on methods that can help whole communities lower their energy reliance so they can become more grid responsive and resilient. So thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Damon, for the nice introduction. And uh, welcome, everyone. And thanks for taking time in this busy period now of final exams during the semester. And uh, I want to talk a bit about new generation computing tools for decarbonized building and district energy systems, and also focus on underlying standards that really helped us uh, putting that in place and contribute to a larger ecosystem here. So I'm going to structure my talk in terms of giving the motivation first, then uh, explain uh, what's different in a decarbonized building environment, then touch up on a couple of uh, foundational standards that we extensively use, and then uh, provide a few key technologies in terms of modeling cards, Spawn of Energy Plus, Open Building Control, and some outlook also on district energy systems, and uh, uh, finish with a summary uh, toward the end. And if you have any clarifying questions, also feel free to interrupt me. And otherwise, we, we're going to have can have a discussion at the end of this uh, presentation. But let me start with the motivation. So the problem that we are facing here differs a bit from state to state. But uh, for example, in California, we have this duck curve, where we really have two problems. So what the curve shows is the, the uh, net uh, generation and lo load on the electrical grid. And we are seeing a big belly or big uh, dip here around uh, noon. That's when we produce a lot of uh, uh, photovoltaic power. And then as the sun sets and the air conditioning systems are still running, we have this very sh uh, sharp ramp around uh, four to six uh, o'clock. So there are basically two problems that we need to focus on. So with efficiency, we want to move that curve down so that we use less energy to begin with. And with demand response or predictive control, we want to flatten that curve so that we can use a more uniform energy, or in some cases, even use a, a more energy during the middle of the day when we may have excess power. And in case that, that we don't have enough storage capacity, then it might be good to actually put that in, into buildings in terms of pre-cooling or preheating buildings. So the whole operation becomes much more dynamic and uh, we need to consider the building really as part of a larger energy infrastructure that has a intermittent generation and also a storage capability on the, on the grid level as well as on the building level. Another view is shown here in terms of the uh, uh, CO2 emissions uh, for the United States and uh, uh, most of the countries actually very similar in that part here. But what's shown is really the uh, 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 carbon dioxide emission historically and then the projections where we need to go. So the green line is basically the, uh, the pathway that we need to achieve in order to uh, address uh, climate change. And the red line is the current trajectory that we are on. So what this graph really shows is that we do need uh, drastic changes and uh, have unprecedented reduction in carbon dioxide emission and do so quickly so that we don't accumulate much more CO2 in the atmosphere and in the oceans. So we really need to make drastic changes uh, very quickly. So what is really needed to get the scale here? And uh, there's certainly what we need uh, includes the uh, business models and policy, but I wanna focus my talk on the technology and processes, including tools and guides for mechanical engineers. So really focus on this uh, last of those uh, three bullets here and talk about the computational tools for design operation and system level R&D 
for building and building system. So not only design the actual buildings, but also operate them. And at the beginning of the pipeline, uh, talk about tools that are used, for example, by, by manufacturer to develop new control solutions or new uh, energy systems. And I'm personally convinced that we are not working here and can't work in a vacuum here. So we have very strong skills. We as a simulation community in terms of uh, engineering, physics, and the building science parts. We have some skills in uh, applied mathematics, but the other experts who know much more about that and similar in terms of modeling languages and tool chains. We have some basic understanding of that, but again, there are other engineering disciplines and science disciplines who focus much more onto those aspects. And we need to see how can we really collaborate with those different fields together to put the new infrastructure in place that allows us to tackle those problems posed by uh, climate change. But let me step back first and uh, try to explain what really changes here from a, a very technologically centric view here. That's really one smaller, small part of a much larger puzzle here. And I'm going to talk about three main parts here in terms of temperature lifts, energy storage, and also the, the daily fluctuations. And if you are looking at temperature changes first, in the past, we basically had fossil fuels. So we had our oil or gas furnace to produce heating. But now there is significant shift toward all electric systems and uh, providing heating by heat pumps. And all of a sudden, the first law, very still important, is not sufficient anymore. So we also need to consider the second law, because in some of those uh, efficient uh, low temperature or low exergy heating and cooling systems, uh, just a change in the uh, temperature that you use to provide heating or cooling to a building of one Kelvin or about two Fahrenheit can impact the energy consumption by about four percentage. So all of a sudden, we have a very high sensitivity to temperature lifts because of the Carnot efficiency. And in order to uh, incur low exergy losses at the system level, control loops need to get much more tightly coupled. So uh, not only the design becomes more complex, but also the control so that we start seeing new system architectures and new control solutions that try to minimize this exergy destruction that happens often in today's systems if they are designed in a way as we designed system about 30 years ago when we burned fossil fuels for heating. The other part is uh, storage. So in the past, about 30 years ago, we built this blast palast, but now there's a very strong shift toward the buildings with active or passive thermal storage. Like uh, the middle photograph here actually shows a chilled water tank at the UC Merced. Uh, there are also uh, other technologies like uh, geothermal uh, uh, bore field heat exchangers or battery, whether they are on site or part of the electric vehicle that become integrated. And here the problem is that uh, for the uh, sensible storage, the thermal energy content is proportional to the temperature lift in that storage. But earlier we saw that temperature lift should actually be minimized because of exergy uh, consideration. So now we already see the first conflict here that we want to have small temperature lifts for exergy reasons, but high temperature lifts to maximize storage capability, for sensible storage at least. Other changes that we are seeing here is the shift of when energy is being consumed. So what's shown on this uh, time chart here is a seasonal marginal CO2 emissions for New York. And you see this very high variability. So basically, with, with this batch uh, uh, of CO2 emission, you should try to shift your loads toward the middle of the day, so similar than in California. So what we really want to do here is design systems and operate them accordingly so that we can minimize the marginal CO2 emissions over the duration of the operation of this system. So if there's little CO2 content in electricity, we want to use more of it. And if you have 30 electricity, we want to reduce the consumption. So we want to minimize this integral here of the marginal CO2 emissions times the temperature lift times the heat that we need to provide to the, to the customer. So summarizing, we see this conflict here of these uh, three different areas. So we want to 
minimize these uh, CO2 emissions, but that requires now intermittent operation. So as a consequence, we need either higher heat transfer areas or operate with bigger temperature differences to provide a similar amount of energy over a shorter period. But this one conflicts now with the lower left part of this triangle here, because earlier we said we want to minimize temperature leak so that we can operate our heat pumps and chillers at the highest coefficient of performance. So that's one conflict. And the other conflict is now with the uh, production at high temperature differences that's needed to maximize utility of energy storage. And this one is now again in a conflict with the low exergy demand. So we have this very dynamic interaction that we want to produce high temperature lifts for storage, low temperature lifts to maximize energy, uh, uh, exergy destructions, and we want to reduce really the time integrated marginal emissions of our CO2 system. So that has fundamental implications then on the design of the system and also on operation of energy systems. And what we show here is a result of the model predictive control of the chiller plant at the UC Merced campus. So shown in red here are uh, over a duration of multiple days, uh, the state of charge of this very large water tank that you see on the left side here. The engineers basically set up the control system in such a way that the uh, chilled water is produced at night when the chiller operates the most efficient because it's cool, cold outside. And then this uh, chilled water is consumed during the day by the university campus. Recently, we went in and did a model predictive control where we take into account how much on-site PV do we uh, generate and also what's the embedded CO2 in a kilowatt hour of electricity and minimized this uh, uh, CO2 uh, that we are basically implicitly emitting by operating our chiller plant. And as you see here, the new optimal control sequence that uh, leads to a state of charge that's completely the opposite of what has been done conventionally. So now we basically charge the storage tank in the middle of the day when we have too much PV power, even though the chiller work the, the least efficient during that time. So you see now we get a complete inversion here of, the, of how we operate this plant here because we take into account the CO2 emissions that we try to minimize here. So that really shows that uh, to, that buildings, they need to transition from the static efficiency consideration to a dynamic control that integrate the, with the grid, PV, EV, waste heat, and storage. So today's building energy systems, they typically uh, operate for comfort. There's very little to no energy awareness in the control of those buildings. I mean, of course, some of the economizer control takes into account uh, the amount of energy that's needed to to heat up or cool down the, the outside air, but there's no explicit notion of energy and temporal availability of storage in those systems. In the future, we need to move toward the building to grid integration, where the building is just one part of a bigger energy infrastructure. You also need to think about in, uh, operating so-called energy hubs that integrate the electrical grid, the gas grid, the building side and also the transportation so that we can shift around energy and make decisions that optimize across this different energy carrier when do we store energy and in what form. So sometimes it might be best to store energy in terms of uh, electricity in a battery. Sometimes it's better to put that into thermal storage and there are also other technologies, for example, that use excess electricity convert the uh, synthetic gas and feed that into the gas network or store it in, in the form of gas. So that's another uh, possibility for optimizing across this different energy carrier. And those energy hubs, they really have the advantage that, that we, we, we can use economy of scale here. So often they work then at the level of a discrete energy system. And at that point, you can actually leverage this investment that's needed into storage technology, such as uh, geothermal heat exchangers or aquifer that are used for buffering, heating, and cooling uh, loads in, in the ground and use that uh, later on when the conditions are not as favorable. And the key technology for that is really model predictive control that allows us to make predictions about every 15 minutes to predict how to operate the system uh, under expected weather conditions, utility signals, and uh, uh, user loads, optimize this uh, 
operations catalog over the next 24 hours and then apply it for 15 minutes typically and then redo the whole uh, optimization again after 15 minutes to continuously operate how we uh, optimize how we operate the system. So what we are seeing here is that those systems become much more complex. And again, looking uh, back now in about the year 2000, there was a study of, about all control related problems. And it turned out that about the third of all problems was due to programming errors. Uh, simply that the control sequences in those commercial buildings were implemented incorrectly due to programming errors. Now, moving forward about 20 years ago, ASHRAE uh, released the guideline 36. So that's a PDF document that uh, has the best in class control sequences for building energy systems. And ASHRAE also uh, released other control sequences in around 2006. And we went ahead and implemented both of them in a control description language that we uh, invented and uh, compared the size of those implementations. And it turned out that the new sequences, which are more efficient, they are also about six to seven times larger. So they are considerably more complex to implement, to test and to bring to the, the actual field. Looking forward, we also want to have pretty responsive predictive control that maybe even optimizes across different energy carriers. You may want to use digital twins to uh, aid in the operation of the building. So complexity goes up and up, yet we don't really recognize that and we don't really have a good means of how to tame this complexity. And I think that's where uh, modeling and simulation can really play a key role here or should play a key role in order to be able that we can bring those more complex systems in a robust way to market the scale needed to address uh, climate change. So what is really needed to get quickly to scale from the point of view of technology? And I typically characterize that in three different categories. So first, we need very robust foundational science. So think about the mathematics, the physics, the controls, and the computer science. And you can consider that like the uh, plastic substrate that's made uh, to, to form uh, Lego bricks. So it's basically the, the basic elements here. Then we also need to have standardized technologies that we can that are robust so that industry and academia can invest in. So we need software standard and hardware standard. So that are the building blocks, the Lego blocks, if you wish so, that can be used then and assembled to form different systems. And then at the end, we need the plug and play system rules and formal design rules for energy systems so that we can use those standardized building blocks and create buildings and integrated energy systems that work robustly at scale. And for that, we need good energy codes, standardized workflows, design and operation tools, and also platforms for integrated systems. And let me talk a bit in the next few slides about these foundational standards. So it's really the, the middle part here uh, that uh, allows them to uh, build those uh, integrated systems in a computation environment and also in the future for uh, hardware in the loop testing if you go to a, a full scale or lab scale experiments. So there are a couple of foundational standards that I wanna discuss. The first one is uh, Modelica. So Modelica is a, a modeling language that has been uh, introduced uh, around 1995 and it's used heavily in the industry now, in the aerospace and automotive industry, as well as in other industry sectors. For example, ABB uh, is optimizing 7% of the power that's being produced in Germany in real time using open source Modelica uh, technologies. So it's really industrial scale technology that uh, hasn't been used in buildings that much. It's still very rarely used by mechanical engineers, but a lot of the control manufacturers or control providers and equipment manufacturers are using Modelica now to uh, design their equipment. And in academia, in particular in Europe, it's uh, very heavily used. In the US, there are a few universities now and national labs to, to uh, start increasing Really, uh, using Modelica here. So for example, in internationally, I've been leading the International Energy Agency Annex 60 and afterwards the BIPSA Project 1 where we invested collectively about uh, 110 men years in or person years in development of these technologies. And on the US side, 
the variety of projects being built on top of those foundational standards like Spawn of Energy Plus and Open Building Control that I'm going to talk about, but also other projects about co-designing uh, thermal system and electrical systems and controls together. The other foundational standard is a FMI or functional mockup interface. So FMI basically provides a, a format that allows you to exchange simulators behind a standardized application programming interface. So what that basically means is that you can uh, create a simulation model in a variety of simulation environments or modeling environments. So pretty much any Modelica tool supports it, but also MATLAB Simulink, uh, LabVIEW has support for it, uh, Energy Plus has FMI import and export facilities. And then you can export the simulator and import it in another tool and link together, for example, different tools with each other. Or you can uh, link now a simulation model of a heat pump, for example, with a hardware in the loop test bed that uh, emulates part of the heat pump system or connects this uh, heat pump model to a control model. And everything is working via standardized application programming interfaces. So for the whole tool integration, it doesn't matter anymore whether this model comes now from Simulink or from Modelica because the, how to interact with them looks exactly the same. And there are about 150 tools that now support the function mockup interface. And that's also a key underlying standard that we are using for the Spawn of Energy Plus development. So let me talk a bit about this uh, tool now for design and controls, uh, specifically the Modelica Billings Library and uh, Spawn of Energy Plus that's based on Modelica and FMI technologies. And the underlying motivation is really the, for the development is that we, we saw uh, quite a variety of new energy systems uh, being researched and brought to markets. For example, on the top left here, there's a schematic diagram of a new system that has been built in Sweden that has one heat pump that provides tempered water around uh, 70 uh, Fahrenheit or 22 degrees Celsius. And then if a room is a little bit warm, it's been cooled with this tempered water. And if a room is a bit chilly, it's been heated up with this tempered water. And then there's a collective uh, return that goes with heat pump again. And so that we have heat recovery or heat exchange among the zones and the very efficient operation of that heat pump because it can work with very small temperature lifts. And the system of that has been built in the south of Sweden, and we did a simulation with Modelica to aid the design and the control development of that system, because all the existing tools were just not up to the task for that. On the bottom left, you see a, a reservoir network, so it's a new architecture for combined discrete heating and cooling system that can be modularly extended, and you can start meshing, for example, lower and higher temperature lifts uh, uh, loops and then connect the buildings in a very modular way to that, where each building has a booster heat pump that boosts the temperature up or down to exactly what that building needs. So they have very high uh, efficiency, and there are more and more of them being built now, in particular in Europe. Another challenge is always how do we get controls when we test that in simulation to actual billing automation system. And for that, we are working on digitization of control delivery process uh, with formal verification based on a, a subset of the Modelica language. And again, FMI technologies for the verification. So that's via the open billing control project. And we also have work then around Modelica that allows us to do model predictive control, not just for buildings, but also look at uh, multi energy sectors. For example, we can optimize uh, PV generation and energy storage under consideration of real and reactive power and the comfort in, in the building. So we can start to doing optimization across the HVAC system, the building thermal envelope, and the actual electrical system by modeling real and reactive power and optimizing the, the joint system so that. So a lot of those demands really gave rise then to the development of the uh, Modelica Buildings Library. So it's an open source library that we have been developing with that has now about 2000 uh, validated uh, models that can cover, for example, uh, air conditioning systems, heating systems, chiller plants, 
Uh, we have support for solar thermal system. There is uh, also a full uh, building and envelope model for room heat transfer as well as uh, natural ventilation. So similar than what you find, for example, in uh, tools like Quantum. We have also a link to uh, computational fluid dynamics. So you can couple CFD together with uh, detailed controls analysis to see, for example, how to uh, best control a, a displacement ventilation. And there's also a package for electrical system where we can model real and reactive power in uh, uh, an AC system, but we can also basically model DC system or two phase or three phase AC systems, balanced or unbalanced, and couple them directly also to the thermal system so that we can have an integrated simulation that can take into account thermal storage, electrical storage, and then also energy harvesting, for example, by wind energy, by PV, or by thermal solar collectors and have a coupled uh, co-design of those systems. So that library is now used by a lot of equipment manufacturers and uh, a lot of academia. And we are working now on uh, bringing that more also into the hand of uh, mechanical design firms in particular to address challenges associated with district energy systems and also with the deployment of uh, heat pump plants. Another large development that we are having is the spawn of Energy Plus. Uh, so Energy Plus has a very strong billing envelope model, but it has, was never really designed for addressing uh, control workflows. And it has uh, highly idealized assumptions about the operation of the system, and it has an uh, implementation or approximation of uh, controls that has a very different uh, behavior than actual billing control uh, systems. On the other hand, Modelica is very well suited for HVAC and control modeling. It's still a challenge to uh, scale up uh, building models, building envelope models in Modelica, and the language doesn't provide that much uh, benefits for modeling building envelope compared to its benefit on the controls and HVAC sites. So what we are developing here is basically a tight coupling between the Modelica HVAC and control models and the Energy Plus envelope model, so that users can seamlessly couple those two systems that had to be coupled before that with a quite uh, involved co-simulation, but now everything basically happens behind the scenes. And then users can do this coupled simulation, and we are working now together with uh, NREL and also with uh, PNNL and the industrial partner like Modelon and the Open Source Model Consortium and Object XX on providing a full package solution that then allows users to do a simulation with Modelica at no cost and using underneath the hood state-of-the-art uh, simulation environments from the Modelica community. There's also a transition then toward uh, export of those sequences into actual building automation systems. So once you have a Modelica implementation of the control, we are having a tool to export that in a JSON format, and we are working now with the ASHRAE Standards Committee on uh, Standard 231. That will then allow you to take a modeled control sequence and upload that via the standard into uh, existing uh, building automation systems and run them natively into the, the product line that you use from that particular control vendor, whether it's Siemens or Honeywell or Belimo or, or automated logic control. So the way that the uh, Spawn of Energy Plus really looks like is shown here for a very simple system here where we only have one room here, just for illustration. So on the top, you see basically the thermal model of the room. So all the heat and mass balance of the air is modeled in Modelica. And behind the scenes, we are automatically uh, generating a binary that contains everything that's needed on the Energy Plus side, linked it up during the runtime with Modelica, and start synchronizing data between Modelica heat balance on the room air and the Energy Plus envelope model. So that's all seamlessly done and behind the scenes, so the user doesn't have to deal with this uh, setup. And then in the middle layer, you see a very simple HVAC system. It's just a fan and a heater. And on the bottom, you see a block diagram of a very simple control where we have basically a, a set point, a PI controller, and then uh, we, we convert the gain of the PI controller to a set point for the leaving temperature of this heater. 
So the bottom now is this control description language that we work on parting that to actual building automation system. The middle layer is now HVAC modeling in Modelica and the top layer is then the interface to Energy Plus. On a bigger system, it looks like that here where we now have, for example, an implementation of such a model here of a DOE uh, prototypical office building uh, shown on the top right uh, here. So you see these five thermal zones coupled to VAV distribution and terminal boxes in Modelica, so shown in the, in the green area. Then as a central air handler unit shown in the uh, yellow area. And on top uh, in uh, orange, you see the control logic from the ASHRAE guidance 36. The question now is really, how do we get this control logic from a simulation model to actual uh, building automation systems? So if you recall about the third of all programming error, of all errors in control uh, systems are due to programming errors. And we basically want to eliminate that and provide a path that allows then the mechanical designer to specify this control sequence, optionally test it in simulation, and then provide a digital specification to the control provider that then the control provider can implement on their particular control product line. So that's an uh, activity that we are doing under the Open Building Control Project, where we are digitizing the control delivery process. So that's uh, done again together with uh, PNNL and also with industry. So the Building Intelligence Group and Taylor Engineering are some uh, key participants in, in that effort. So the goal is really to digitize the whole control delivery process so that mechanical designer can take pre-configured uh, control sequences from a library that has been well tested and vetted, optionally test them with the energy model in the loop and uh, to see how efficient they are. They could be tweaked and improved for the particular building, then exported as a specification together with formal verification tests for the commissioning agent. Then the control provider would bid on the job based on this electronic specification and if the control provider selected use machine to machine translation to translate this electronic specification in the ASHRAE 231P uh, standard into their control product line. So they keep using their control product lines and the commissioning agent would then test the actual implemented sequence against the formal verification tests that are exported from the simulation model and see whether the implemented sequence really works according to specification. And the whole end-to-end -end project has, uh, workflow has been prototyped and is uh, written up in this uh, journal paper that's on the bottom of this uh, uh, presentation slide. So as I mentioned earlier, those control sequences, uh, the newer ones are typically much more energy efficient. So we see savings often around 20 to 30 percentage, but uh, there's a large range between 10 and maybe 50 or 60 percentage, depending on the baseline and the climate zone. But the problem is really that those sequences are much more complex. So they are more detailed to address for uh, some of those inefficiencies that the existing sequences, the older uh, versions have, and with this complexity really comes the need of how we handle that. So what's shown here on the middle part is uh, how many lines of codes are needed for a baseline system that has a control sequence from 20 years ago and the guidance of the six implementation. And now what's interesting here is in the past, controls was a very small part. It was about 10 percentage of the total number of lines of code that you need in your simulation model. With a new sequence, it's about a third of the whole code. So we really want to be able to package that code and use a standard how to express it so it, that we can have a, a good way to simulate it and then to transmit it to building automation systems. And that's what's being addressed with the control description language that we initiated uh, at ASHRAE, which now formed the standards committee that uh, complements then uh, other guidelines and standards like the BACnet standard who is dealing with communication, the 223P standard that deals with semantic modeling. And uh, what we basically address here is the gap that there's no standard that allows us to express the logic of control sequences. So that's what this uh, CDL standard uh, will address. And in a prototype translation, we 
showed the feasibility of translating these sequences to a control uh, product line. So on the left -hand side here, you see uh, implementation of a variable air volume flow uh, control sequence according to the guideline 36 specification. And we translated that via machine to machine code translation to a web control from automated logic. So on the right hand side, you see the same control blocks, but now auto generated. Uh, we are the uh, software translation, and we said we basically showed the feasibility that we can move from a simulation model to a commercial existing control product line uh, without having to manually program this uh, control sequence. So we can test controls now in simulation, and then via this prototype translator, uh, implement them on control product line. So that flow is now standardized via ASHRAE standard 231P that will allow then, uh, going from this uh, control description language, which is a subset of the Modelica language, into a JSON representation, and from there to different control product lines. But in the future, it's uh, uh, conceivable that the new product lines would directly generate code then based on uh, CDL without having to go via this uh, JSON representation. So because CDL is a proper subset of the Modelica language, we can already now generate code in C, in the C language, or in the FMI specification, or a new variant of FMI that's specifically target for, targeted for uh, real-time uh, usage. And all this uh, open source uh, technology is already existing, so that new control product lines could actually bypass the, the JSON representation and use uh, state-of-the-art uh, computational tools uh, as a path toward implementation of uh, control sequences on next generation control product lines. So we basically address on one side the uh, existing legacy control systems, yet provide the technology that we put in place that allows us the industry also to move them forward into use of these uh, uh, new state-of-the-art standards. So let me talk quickly about uh, uh, enabling shared resources so district energy systems. So what I showed earlier in the graph is that, is that we really need uh, quick and very drastic changes in the CO2 emissions of our energy systems if we want to uh, meet the, the climate goals that are needed to about uh, serious uh, impacts from uh, climate change. So the question for us is really, how do we enable a seamless integrated formal workflow that allows a robust decarbonization at scale? And for that, we certainly need new energy concepts that integrate uh, renewable and storage at scale. We need associated planning tools, also new controls approaches that take into account the dynamics of those systems. And we need to learn how to better operate those systems and uh, manage uh, those uh, dynamic operational uh, constraints that are imposed by the fluctuation of renewable energy and uh, limited availability of energy storage. So what we saw in the industry is these uh, different generations for the strict energy systems. So around uh, the uh, 1900s, steam systems were very uh, uh, popular. There's still a lot of them existing in, in the US, but uh, there was uh, slowly a trend toward lower and lower uh, distribution and return temperatures for a heating system that moved then together with integration of uh, different uh, generation and also uh, this uh, more modularization, moved this first generation to a second, third and fourth generation of the strict energy system. And the first generation, they typically operate near about uh, 50 to 60 degrees Celsius and have a return temperature of about 25 degrees Celsius. So they are much more efficient for integration of renewable, but there's now a new generation, not, uh, not necessarily a new generation, but a new type of ener uh, district energy system that combines heating and cooling into one system. In some cases, in some literature, it's called the fifth generation district energy system, but there's a debate whether they are really a new generation or just a special case of this fourth generation. But the key of them is that they operate near ambient temperature. So 
they operate with water being distributed around 4 to 16 degrees Celsius. So that's near freezing temperature up to about 60 Fahrenheit. And then have booster heat pumps and chillers that uh, boost the temperature up or down to exactly what that building needs. So those systems, they, they are really considered to be key in supporting decarbonization in a lot of the European countries. And uh, shown here are the number of systems uh, that have been entering the market over the last few years. So there's a, a pretty fast uptake of those systems here because they have a very good uh, properties for integration of a low grade uh, excess heat, whether that's from a data center or from a sewage plant or from a uh, other heat source. We, we got a, a project here on behalf of Sidewalk Labs, who was uh, commissioned to uh, put the energy plan or energy concept uh, in place for uh, the uh, development in Toronto at the water side, at the K-side. So it's a waterfront development that uh, Sidewalk Lab has been doing. And we have been asked of uh, what kind of district energy system should be installed there and do those uh, uh, low temperature bidirectional district heating system really work in this context. And just as a piece of history, so some of those systems, they have been built, but there have been uh, hydraulic control problems uh, being reported from some of those installations. And in this project here, we went ahead and uh, analyzed those systems with uh, Modelica and looked into whether we can reproduce some of those control problems. And sure enough, we were able to come up with a situation where we can actually introduce instability that propagates for the whole district energy system. And based on that, we devised a different architecture that does not suffer those uh, problems. And that has some other benefits in terms of modular extensibility. So this one is now, was now a case where we could use our computational tools to analyze potential problems, minimize the risk of building one of those systems by redesigning the system into a different architecture that does not suffer this problem yet still has a high uh, efficiency. We also looked into uh, uh, such system together with some uh, collaborators in, in Europe, where we looked into two different topologies. So first is a bidirectional network that's shown on the left-hand side. So that's thermodynamically the, the optimal system and then a network reservoir network. And so a better configuration of the district energy distribution uh, and better control. We were able to uh, reduce energy consumption of this network topology. Uh, reservoir network to about the same as the thermodynamically optimal reservoir network. But one question is really how do we get now to scale uh, uh, for those systems? And what's shown here are, uh, is a schematic diagram of uh, uh, energy transfer substation that was provided us by the design firm Integral. And those systems tend to be quite complex, as you can see here. So we are working now at the Berkeley Lab on a template system that allows us then to uh, customize those systems and quickly apply them to different districts and not only apply it ourselves, but also put them in libraries so the mechanical designer can start using those systems, customize them to their particular plant look at their energy analysis, and in the future, then also start exporting uh, control sequences from those simulation models. So I think what that uh, development really needs here is the, to have a very uh, formal framework underneath. So in our case, we use heavily Modelic and FMI because that really allows us to have, sol to have solid mathematics have good levels of abstractions that allows us to move between simulation and control implementation and also optimization. And we can reuse then a lot of the technology that has been developed by others. And just to uh, close here with a quick outlook here, what's coming in the near future from these uh, uh, developers is the uh, new standard called uh, EFMI. And in the past, if you want to couple, for example, a simulation model of a control to a to real hardware or part of controller to a, a control algorithm to a hardware, 
you needed a superhero who understands physical modeling, control engineering, numerics, and uh, embedded computing. And there are not very many of those superhero function developers. So what is being developed is a new standard now, EFMI, that allows them to seamlessly go between physical modeling, generate code for embedded systems, and through that leverage basically all these different uh, domain expertise in the way that physical modeling experts can develop the physical model, the control engineers can develop the controls, the software developers who develop the whole tool chain to uh, generate code for embedded systems. But put that, they are all put in a standard so that we can start interacting between these different disciplines and don't have to deal manually into how to port, for example, this logic from a simulation testing environment to actual hardware for operation. And I just want to close here, I think with uh, this slide here that uh, tries to illustrate that we really need to look with our research and development at these different levels or layers. So in the top level, we really need to work on model-based design flows and how to operate uh, those engineered systems. We need to be very clear about functional requirements of those uh, models and uh, systems and how we um, link the digital models to actual systems at a different level of abstraction because it's a different abstraction that you use if you just do a simulation or if you generate code for implementation of a, on a controller or if you generate code for optimization. And in order to scale that and collaborate with a domain expert, we really need to work on the lower level on those frameworks for multi-scale simulation optimization on a modular modeling infrastructure and then put in place, for example, domain-specific libraries that become those uh, building blocks that can be used by the mechanical designer to quickly instantiate such systems and uh, hide a lot of the complexity that's inherent in these uh, controls and in these energy systems. So with that, um, I uh, would like to close here and I'm happy to uh, have any discussion or uh, answer any questions. All right. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Dr. Wetter. Uh, we do have a couple questions uh, in the chat. Um, the first one being, uh, would you be willing to share the presentation deck with uh, the audience? Yeah, I can certainly share that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, if you can just email that to me, I'll uh, post it on our website with the video uh, mm -hmm. recording yes, that we have. All right. Uh, and then, uh, Damon, do you want to take over the more technical questions? <laughs> sure. Um, so there was a question from Amir Jose, and Amir, feel free to chime in as well. Um, is the idea for control manufacturers um, to, you know, build in these systems, assuming that they will come, um, you know, that Siemens and automated logic and, and others will kind of develop like their side of that interaction. And how do you envision adoption by HVAC controls or, you know, the energy software development community? And it seems like you, you began to answer that a little bit at the end as well, in terms of differentiating different mm -hmm. roles, yeah, so yeah. it's no longer a superhero. Um, but yeah, specifically how, you know, what's your vision for how you know, manufacturers will, will interact with this new workflow. Yes, yeah, yeah, that's a good question here. And with the ASHRAE standard 231, most of the people on that committee are actual control providers, so the, 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 the various control companies. And there are certainly different uh, use cases and application that the different people in, in, in the room there have in mind, so in one strong part is really being able to exchange control logic among different systems and have a path for also testing controls. So in some, from some control companies, we, we see that they are more ahead and they, they already use some elements of this code generation. Others are more uh, ad hoc so far and do more manual process. So the, it really depends very much to which company you talk, how much uh, pool there is for this, this technology and how much probably push at some point you have to do because a lot of those very high performance systems, they become much more complex. And we hear it from control manufacturers as well as from design engineers that there are, off, there are, there are some systems that can take 
uh, many months to commission correctly. And just lately, I talked with someone who had a, a combined heat and power uh, plant built in, in Europe. And they basically said, look, we built it, we tried to operate it, and it switched off since 10 years. It's a stranded asset because we can't get it to operate robustly. So I think there are certainly some of these pain points of those more advanced systems who are just much harder to, to get to work correctly. Some companies really subscribe now to this uh, process of model-based uh, design flows and model-based engineering that links modeling with simulation together. And you see quite a few of those companies publishing, for example, also on the, the Modelica conferences. Others are more ad hoc and they don't quite have the technology put in place for doing that. But uh, I think if we really move toward those more complex systems, we have to think how we can get them to scale in a robust way. And we do know that the, even the simpler control sequence that we see in today's buildings, they often don't work. So as I showed in this uh, graphic here, a third of all control-related problems in commercial buildings is due to programming errors. And I think that's getting worse as complexity increases. I think we're going to see a mix between early adopters and people who are more conservative and may adopt hopefully later in the process. But the certainly pool that we see from various companies and others, we need probably to do a bit more work in convincing that this one is the, the right path to go. Thank you. And um, Bharat um, has a, a question as well. Uh, what is the advantage of linking Medelica with Energy Plus instead of just enhancing the Energy Plus code itself to um, handle the control sequences. Yeah, so it's not only about the control sequences. So that's one part of it, but then it's also the whole HVAC system. So Energy Plus has basically a, a built-in simulation manager that where basically the, the envelope is first simulated and it reports to the HVAC system of how much heating it needs to have over the next time step in order to meet the set point. Then there's a computation going on in the HVAC system to see which component should provide that cooling uh, demand. And then there's another iteration happening to correct for the situation that the system may not be uh, sufficiently sized and only part of the cooling demand can be provided. So that's a complete different semantics than in what you see in actual building control sequences. In building control sequences, you measure room temperature. You may uh, act, for example, on the position of a VAV damper. And that VAV damper may send a cooling request to the plant and that, or, or the air handler unit. And the air handler unit may adjust the supply air temperature set point with a trim and response logic. And that set point is being compared to the leaving air temperature on the coil. And again, that acts on the valve that's used to uh, uh, on the water side of that coil. So it's a completely different semantics. It's very different input and output correlation between those models. So in order to enable such a simulation of the controls in Energy Plus, you would have to rewrite the HVAC models, rewrite the controls, you need to provide completely from numerical solvers because the solvers in Energy Plus cannot handle with those mixed discrete and continuous time systems coupled to event-driven system that you may have, for example, if you have a uh, on-off switch from a thermostat and a PI controller for a coil leaving temperature. So they are mathematically very complicated systems to solve. And rather than replicating what's already available in the open source and open implementations of the Modelica community, rather than replicating that, which is just not feasible given the huge investment that's being needed in Energy Plus, we went ahead and said, let's, let's look, let's use this open standard, add libraries now for our application domain, so it's uh, energy models and uh, control models, and couple it up to Energy Plus. There's no need that we need to uh, reinvent all those solution methods that are already in place and for which we have a, a whole ecosystem of uh, simulation people and modeling people developing that for us. So it would be basically reinventing the wheel uh, that would require 
expertise that we don't have and costs that would be way beyond anything that's being invested already on in the tool development for energy modeling. Thank you. Thank you for that mm -hmm. background. Oh, yeah. um, that, that makes a lot of sense. One question that I personally had, um, I, I love the slide of the ostrich with its head in the sand with complexity about mm -hmm. yep. people, you know, fear of complexity. And you also mentioned, you know, the arising of programming errors as complexity increases. And one friction point that we've noticed at our lab when we try to say, go in and do a pilot study of connecting a simulation with the building is there's a lot of resistance it's it's a big pain point um for the controls company i don't want to throw any one company under the bus because it's been a number of locations whether that's automated logic or siemens or, or delta you know the the person there feels ownership of the building um, who's been responsible for programming it and they're worried about somebody else coming in messing up that programming um causing errors in your new workflow that you've kind of proposed with that standard 231p or, or that efmi how how do you see people interacting with the system if say a change needs to be made you know who's going to be called um, mm -hmm. to change if say there's a new rooftop unit added or a new tenant in the building or something mm -hmm. yeah yeah so there are different uh, approaches that, that can be done. So one would be that one could uh, publish libraries for those different systems, let's say the rooftop unit or the VAV system, and they could have, uh, let's say, certification or checksum and say, okay, they are approved by vendor X or they are released by ASHRAE or any other organization. And then a designer could basically just reference them via, via their name, as is used already now in the software, and then a control provider would see, okay, this uh, mechanical engineer now wants to use this ASHRAE sequence, or this mechanical engineer wants to use this carrier approved or Siemens approved control sequence for that building. And then they at least they know exactly what sequence is being used here. So you would have a code associated with that. The second approach is if a designer doesn't like now how, for example, the economizer is being controlled, the designer could go in and make changes. But now with, uh, you can identify exactly what has been changed compared to the original sequence. And now the control provider has two choices. So he could either trust that the change is being made correctly and translate that to the actual uh, control platform, or he can uh, do the change manually by reprogramming the control as the control provider already does today. But at least now the control provider has a clear specification of what the engineer wants to do. Because often today's specifications are just done in a Microsoft Word document and they are very ambiguous, often they are incomplete and very hard to interpret. And I think we get through this process workflow much more clarity in terms of what changes should be done. And then we still provide the control provider the option to, to use their current process. So if you go back to that slide, of, uh, let's show that quickly. Uh, yeah. At this interface here from the designer to the control provider, we are not forcing the control provider to use machine to machine translation, but we provide the opportunity. And we postulate that once these tools are in place, that would be the faster and cheaper and more robust way. But the control provider can still manually program those sequences and keep ownership, ownership of that. But at the end, we, in the commissioning, we have now the opportunity to test the actual installed or programmed sequence against the digital twin from the design phase. And if the control provider implemented something differently, we can basically point to it and say, look, this part of the sequence you didn't implement as we specify, go in and change it. So we basically provide the carrot here with the tools and the standard to do it more efficient. And the stick in the sense that if they're gonna do the manual pass, we're going to test at the end to make sure that we actually get implemented what we wanted up front. That makes sense. Makes sense. 
Thank you. Um, a question from uh, Brian Emptman, um, manages a facility here in town, uh, campus. How friendly is the Medellica interface? And would engineering consulting firms want to have dedicated Medellica experts on staff, similar to energy modelers? Or is it reasonable to expect um, design mechanical engineers to be able to pick up Medellica and perform the sequence testing themselves? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I would say, like with any other language, you need training. And also, if you do an energy plus or transis or do two simulation, you, you want to send that staff to a training first so they know how to use the tool. Uh, I had I accompanied with a lot of people who were new to Modelica. And one feedback I actually got from a from, uh, uh, visitor lately is that they, they think it's much more intuitive because you actually can connect systems as you do in reality. You can inspect easily what's underneath the hood so you can see what are the assumptions underneath. Uh, what we often struggle is not so much the language itself, because it's a little bit of training. It, it's not that hard, and you can do most of it really on the graphical uh, uh, level if you want, if wish to do so. And you only have, can, have to go to the text level if you want to, and if, you, if you're comfortable to doing that. But what we often struggle with is that people don't know what they want to simulate. So they don't know the application area and don't know exactly what question to ask. In Modelica, because it's so flexible, it, allow, it requires for now still to assemble HVAC system component by component and then implementing the control sequences for that. And not many people understand energy systems enough, hydraulics enough, and also the controls. How we address that is by developing customizable templates that are now in, in development where a user or mechanical engineer can then just select, for example, a VAV system with five thermal zones and uh, economize operation according to uh, Title 24 if you're in California. And you can put in your uh, set point schedules and it will generate then a Modelica model together with the controls of that mechanical system so that we guide the user much more in assembling these systems and we are using them pre-configured uh, template models of the mechanical system and the control system. That gets around the complexity that's otherwise caused by having to do this component-based modeling, but that's not really a weakness of Modelica, it would be exactly the same if you come up with another language. And also if you use tools like Transys, for example, you also need to know the energy system. Otherwise you do garbage in, garbage out, which those tools allow you to do. So you really need to understand what you want to simulate and how to implement control up until we get to the point where we can release those pre-configured control sequences, which should be happening over the next uh, one or two years. But there's a point in case we had a visitor actually from the one that implemented that system that I showed before with that one heat pump that provides heating and cooling. And they struggled for more than a year to try to simulate that in another simulation model coupled to Excel sheets to that patches what couldn't be done in, in that simulation model or that simulation program and by providing some training to that person Within a few weeks, that person was basically able to simulate the system. We developed together the controls for it, which turned out to be quite simple. And that person is now uh, still using Modelica to design, for example, new district energy systems. So it's uh, quite intuitive to learn, but you do need to make an investment in learning the language of a few days of training that most Modelica tool provider offer. And you need to know the application domain. So you need to know the engineering underneath in terms of the energy systems and controls. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. uh, sure. There, there is a poll that's out 